Hi everyone, welcome and good evening. My name is Jasmine and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and the Harvard Library, I'm excited to introduce this virtual event with Raghavir Parthasarathy presenting his new book, So Simple a Beginning, How Four Physical Principles Shape Our Living World, joined in conversation by Philip Nelson. Thanks so much for joining us virtually this evening. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. To learn more about this series and our other upcoming events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter, or check out the page harvard.com slash science for more info. I'll also be posting a link to the Science Research Public Lectures channel in the chat where you can view previous talks you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase So Simple Beginning on harvard.com. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of this landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and of course, for science. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Raghavir Parthasarathy is a professor of physics at the University of Oregon. His research explores the intersections between biology and physics, focusing especially on how communities of gut microbes organize themselves in space and time. His teaching activities include courses for non-science majors, such as the Biophysics for Non-Scientists class and courses on energy and the environment. In 2020, he was selected as a fellow of the American Physical Society. Tonight, he'll be joined in conversation by Philip Nelson, author of Biological Physics, Physical Models of Living Systems, and From Photon to Neuron. He is on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania and has been chair of the American Physical Society's Division of Biological Physics. This evening, they've joined us for a discussion of Raghavir's new book, So Simple a Beginning, How Four Physical Principles Shape Our Living World. This book, which features dozens of original watercolors and drawings by the author, is a sweeping tour of how biophysics is transforming our understanding of life on Earth and enabling potentially life-saving but controversial technologies, such as gene editing, artificial organ growth, and ecosystem engineering. Rob Phillips, author of The Molecular Switch, calls this book a delightful narrative guide to the exciting and important ways in which physics and biology come together to help us understand living matter. We've got a lot to learn this evening, so without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Raghavir and Philip. Well, thanks. Jasmine. Um, Raghu, it's been a while. I was just trying to remember as we got going, you know, how you and I first met each other. It must have been at one of those annual meetings. Yeah, I think it was at one of the American Physical Society March meetings. Um, I can't remember which one, but but for the benefit of those in the audience, you, you'll have to kind of imagine a gathering of about 10,000 physicists um, packed into a convention center mostly giving 10 minute talks. So it's almost like a kind of hive or buzz of, of, of activity. Um, so people attending talks, but also kind of uh, mobbing the hallways and, and finding odd places to sit and chat with one another. Uh, so it's one of these, which are you know both places to learn new information, but also meet people and get ideas and talk about things that I think yeah, Phil and I probably had our first conversations. And we probably had uh, chats at every March meeting since. You know, if it's it's hard to picture this, I know, but in between all those rapid fire ten minute talks, you schmooze with your friends, and then you wind up meeting your friends' friends, and that's most likely how it happened. That's how a lot of scientists meet each other. Mm -hmm. Hey, why don't you just uh, tell us a little bit about your book to begin with, and then we'll talk yeah, about some. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I want to thank um, you for for being part of this conversation, and Harvard Bookstore for putting this event together and, and inviting us. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, very much looking forward to it. And um, as Jasmine mentioned, I'm a physicist, uh, but one who's become entranced by the living world. Um, and in fact, as she mentioned, I, I run a research lab that mostly studies the gut microbiome. 
So collections of bacteria, you know, like this little guy that live in a very messy, complicated environment that seems as far removed from the popular picture of physics as it's possible to be. But there are in fact connections between biology and physics and they're really abundant, they're beautiful and they're, they're even practically important. And there's a whole field called either biophysics or biological physics uh, that explores these connections. So um, there are a lot of just really beautiful insights into how life works that have emerged from this biophysical perspective. But I felt for many years that these are largely outside of the view of the general public. And you know that spurred me to write this book, I'll try to make it right side up, um, about which I'll say more later. But I thought I'd actually start out noting that I was not born a biophysicist. Um, so by the time I was in high school, I, I, I knew that I was fond of math and physics um, and other things like art, but biology was very much not on my list of favorites. I liked nature quite a lot, but biology as a subject seemed something that was just, you know, an unpleasant thing to study, just a lot of memorization, a hodgepodge of stuff without kind of predictability or sort of elegance. And I should point out that I was wrong in this view, although we still typically teach biology um, as if this kind of narrow perspective were, were true. Um, but that story of like how we teach things is a, is a different one. And maybe we'll come back to that uh, later on in the hour. So I stayed away from biology and in college, I majored in physics and I never set foot in a biology class. And then in graduate school, I continued not being a biophysicist. Uh, I mostly worked on nanostructures and other small stuff. But slowly, thanks to some connections that actually emerged from my research, uh, but also thanks to a lot of inspiring interactions with colleagues and just the sheer volume of stuff that's going on in contemporary biology, um, I came to the realization that uh, probably many of, many of us who metamorphose into biophysicists make that there is a really large and fascinating intersection between biology and physics, and that physical laws do in fact guide and constrain and also explain uh, the form and function of living things. There are in fact grand themes, uh, clever materials, deep principles, uh, all of that stuff. But before veering off into abstractions, I thought, okay, uh, I thought I'd start off with a con concrete example. So um, I'll illustrate a couple of things first and I'll start off with a concrete example. So in my book, um, I discuss things like the exquisite shape, oh, sorry, you can't see that. I need to actually turn on screen sharing. There we go. Um, I discuss things like the exquisite shapes of proteins, one of which is shown over here. Um, the patterning of limbs as embryos develop, there's some like fingers and stuff here, stunning new gene editing techniques like CRISPR and more. But the example that I'm gonna start off with, which is also in the book, is a, a quick one and a fairly simple one. And it takes us back a couple of decades to um, a rather tragic event. So what I'm showing you here is the gravestone of Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. It's a bit hard to read, but he was born on August 7th, 1963, and died on August 9th, two days later. He was born five and a half weeks premature. Um, so this is Patrick Bouvier Kennedy, the son of, of uh, um, the president and his wife. So he was born five and a half weeks premature, and he died of something called infant respiratory distress syndrome. And this was sadly very common. In the U.S. alone, there were about 25,000 deaths per year from infant respiratory distress syndrome. In the decades since, however, something really remarkable happened. So what I'm showing is the deaths per 100,000 births over time. And we see that this has just plummeted from this very large number to its current value of less of about 400 deaths per year in the United States, despite the number of premature births being much more, uh, much more common. So how did this remarkable decline happen? So the answer, it turns out, has to do with lungs and liquids. So if you imagine your lungs, especially you know, if you imagine talking to you know, your children or something, some, somebody in elementary school and ask them, what's your picture of lungs? The common picture that comes up is that your lungs are like a balloon that you inflate and deflate as you breathe. And that's actually a very good picture, uh, but an even better one is that it's a wet balloon. So the surface of your lungs is coated with watery mucus. So why should this matter? So liquids like to stick together. Their molecules attract one another, and that's in fact what makes a liquid a liquid. So if you have some water that has a surface, an interesting issue comes up that the water molecules that are at the surface are energetically speaking unhappy. They'd like to have water molecules all around them like these guys, but they have air molecules on one side, they don't have water molecules all around, all around them. And as a result, 
the water as a whole tries to minimize how much surface area it has to minimize this energetic unhappiness with, with surfaces. So this property, which you've probably heard of, is called surface tension. So I thought to myself, what's the point of doing this live if I don't give myself a chance to uh, completely flop and, and uh, make a fool of myself? So I thought I'd make a little demonstration of surface tension, and we're going to tie this back to the lungs just a little bit. So if I can point this appropriately, we have a dish of water over here. And it's just nice, clean water. And I'm going to take a nice, clean steel paper clip and hopefully, good, I set it there. And hopefully you can see that the paper clip is sitting nicely on top of the water. And that's because the water wants to have a flat surface there. And it's resisting the deformation that that paper clip pulled on by gravity is causing. So there's surface tension for you. Now I can lower the surface tension of the water. And I can do that, for example, by adding soap. So I've taken some dish soap. I'm just going to add a little bit of it here. And a bit more. And a bit more. I picked the world's. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully you could see that now the paper clip does not, it has sunk to the bottom. And if I try to put it back on the top of the water, it will not sit there anymore. I have lowered the surface tension of the water by adding that soap. So what's going on here is that those soap molecules, part of them, they all look kind of like this. They have a little part that likes water and a part that doesn't like water. So they are perfectly happy to go to the surface of the water, demonstrated there, now the water molecules don't have to be at that surface, and the whole liquid just doesn't care so much about um, things that might increase its surface area, and it resists this change in surface area much less. So what does this possibly have to do with the lungs? Well, like I said, your lungs you can think of as this wet balloon. And so each time you breathe in, you're expanding that wet surface area, and that is very energetically challenging to do. Excuse so me. What do you do? This is not where, oh, yeah. Was you're, that a expanding it, you're expanding it by a lot, right? You're expanding, you're expanding it, by, it by a lot, yes. By a football yes. field, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so that's a great, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Phil. There's this great um, uh, or property of your lungs. They have the volume of a few tennis balls, but the surface area of a tennis court. So mm. you have this highly corrugated kind of surface that has an enormous surface area. And so you're expanding it by yeah, a, a lot each time you, you breathe in. Yeah, thanks. So... It takes a lot of energy to expand a liquid surface. So what do you do? Well, what you do is actually add soap. So the cells lining, lining your lungs secrete a molecule that has the fancy name of lung surfactant. But chemically, it's extremely similar to dish soap. And so that lowers the surface tension of that liquid, making it energetically much easier to breathe uh, and expand that surface. So what's the connection to premature infants? So if we were chatting in person, I would ask, I, I would ask you all, um, and maybe I'll just pause for just a second while you think about this, and I'll express my regrets that we're not in a room together. But you might have guessed that the challenge is that you only start making this, this lung soap, this lung surfactant, at around 30 weeks of gestation, so fairly late. So if you're born several weeks early, you don't have it. Breathing is hard. It's too hard for your tiny muscles, and left alone, you would die. But the treatment is wonderfully simple. You add soap. So that's what's done. You add in lung surfactant, just pipe it into the lung. Um, either purified from animals or synthetically made, um, and the baby can breathe all as well. And that graph I showed and that story it tells of hundreds of thousands of lives saved came about not because of some complicated biochemistry or some detailed genetic analysis, but really because of understanding the physics of liquids and how it connects to the physics of breathing. So I'll stop there for at least part one of the intro of things. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you know, that's really interesting. And it, it sort of got me thinking, um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, science, it's all deductive. Somebody has some, some Einstein has some divine inspiration, and then you just work out all the details that follow from that inspiration. And that doesn't really sound like the story you're telling. There was probably a lot of uh, trial and error in there as well. Yeah, and yeah, trial people, and error. Oh, yeah, go ahead. And then other times you hear people saying, oh, yeah, science, it's all inductive. It's all details. 
you know, you just measure lots and lots of stuff. And that doesn't sound right either, because, you know, you, you have to have the big idea as well. I think it's more this kind of exquisite dance between those two, where you're trying to figure out of all the millions of details, which ones actually matter. Right. And of all the millions of inspirations that you might have, which ones explain just one thing and which ones explain a whole lot of things. So right. maybe you could just say a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And especially this thing of ideas that can explain a lot of things. One of the things I think is really fascinating about biophysics that's actually illustrated in, in, in this story as well, is a lot of the, the advances come from connecting different topics together. Right. Like plenty of people studied lungs for you know, centuries or, and even in a modern anatomical sense for, for you know, well over a century. People studied liquids also for, for centuries. Um, but realizing that there's this connection between the two and that has actual kind of relevance to health and physiology took until like the 1960s or 70s. Yeah. So the bottleneck wasn't, um, you know, some one person being particularly brilliant or the bottle and the bottleneck also was not a particular set of experiments, but really realizing that there are ideas that can that can bridge different topics and that offer the solution to one field from another field. And that seems to come up again and again. It's one of the reasons I think actually biophysics is so uh, so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And then another thing you said at the beginning, uh, you said something about this field of biological physics that many people don't even know about. It just reminded me that uh, the National Academies of Science, just, they just made this big report about biological physics. And that was one big point they made. They said, a lot of students don't even know that this field exists until it's kind of too late and they've chosen some other direction or something to do. So um, I think of books like yours, for instance, as helping young people to see that there's a fascinating area that wasn't mentioned to them in high school. That yeah, that's go to university and say, hey, I want more. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. And, and I, yeah, I definitely strongly I strongly agree yeah, that this realization that biophysics exists is, is not nearly as widespread as one, one would like. And I should point out that's true of actually many fields that are you know, really interesting these days uh, in a contemporary sense. I actually gave a talk to incoming freshmen here at the University of Oregon, like about 200 of them or so. And I was trying to think of like what to talk about. This is like at the orientation part. So they, they haven't even started taking classes or anything like that. And I actually gave my talk on um, book was, I sort of entitled it Biophysics Exists, but it, I didn't want to just talk about biophysics. So I also mentioned other topics that, you know, aren't part of the standard set of subjects that one is ex often exposed to. Um, people often don't know that statistics, which I think if you had asked me in high school, I would have thought, well, that sounds really boring. It's just calculating like the averages of things or things like that. But it's a really beautiful and vibrant field. And you might not, if you're in high school, know that that exists or linguistics um, or, yeah, definitely biophysics and these things that are um, unfamiliar and they're often at the at the borders and, and the intersections between kind of traditional fields. So I encourage people to like look out for for the areas that they might not know exist. And for approachable books on those areas. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, um, then if I if I can pick up on another thing you said. Uh, you pointed out that you weren't in bio biological physics to begin with, then you had to find it. And I just kind of wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how you made that transition. And did you pick up the sense that something important was happening in the air or by reading some important book or something? What got it on your yeah. radar and made you think that uh, it was worth a closer look? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And um, maybe also I'll point out just e even more broadly than myself, I think lots of people, um, you know, I point out I wasn't born a biophysicist, but I think that's true of most of us who are biophysicists. We, we kind of got into this through various routes and a lot of it was um, kind of stumbling upon or being exposed to things that really kind of, you know, piqued our interests. And, um, you know, for me, there were, there were quite a few things. One is the sort of general sense in the air that there was a lot of, of interesting things going on in contemporary kind of life sciences. And one thing that helped a lot, actually, is that I was, when I was in graduate school, a bunch of us had 
uh, a, a bunch of us graduate students and postdoctoral researchers at a weekly uh, like journal club in which we just find interesting papers and chat about them. And we also kind of broadened that to things that we just felt we should know more about. Yes, um, yes. So we would do these, especially in summer, these sort of month long kind of reading things. Yeah. One of the books we read was called Landmark Papers in Cell Biology, which was mm. basically just reprints of Landmark Papers in Cell Biology with also like a little introductory essay by somebody, but it gave you a sense of like what were, what were big things. Um, we read one of the the kind of classic um, biophysics books, which I know you're very aware of, um, Howard Berg's Random Walks in Biology, um, yeah. which is a beautiful book if anybody in the audience is looking for something, uh, with a little bit of math getting into um, how uh, bacteria navigate and things like that. Another thing that was actually some popular literature, things like, um, I probably have it here, I should have thought of it. Oh yeah, good. Books by Stephen Vogel. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Who's wonderful? Who unfortunately passed away a few years ago, but writes these wonderful um, yeah. books, essentially on biomechanics. Right. So um, you know, how do birds fly and fish swim, and and all of these kinds of things that are really fascinating and just beautifully written. And um, I came across things like that. So really, just realizing all of these kind of happen at the same time. The sort of idea that you know there is a lot. Um, kind of going on in these areas, and then making um, an effort not to sort of study them in a, a, at the beginning, in an academic sense at least, but to try to get kind of a sense of you know what all is out there. Um, yeah, I yeah, should point out kid, kids these days have it easier because you know people like you write these wonderful textbooks. I, I have one of yours up here to, thanks. <laughs> to make but, the but, path but, easier. Um, but tonight we're talking about you. Hey, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> But I wonder, you know, there must have been a, there's, there's, there's a difference between thinking a topic is interesting and reading something about it and switching your professional right, right. activity, yeah, which so, is a very precarious moment in a career. Right. I, there were, probably was a time when you got something rejected and you said, holy smokes, I'm never going to get into this business. <laughs> yeah, bet. so actually, I should say a little bit more specifically about how I got into the, the things I got mm. into. Um, which involved actually kind of several changes of path and changes of field. So um, I, I just want to say I admire that so much. No, oh, thanks. That you did that, but go ahead. Thank you. So um, in my in my PhD work, like I had mentioned, it wasn't biophysical, but it had some um, nudges in that direction. So mm -hmm. as I think the most important example. A lot of what I did my research on were these things called nanocrystals, which are you know, very small um, blocks of matter. And I was especially looking at things like, how can an array of nanocrystals, things that are so small, it takes a lot of energy just to put one extra electron on them. If you have a whole bunch of these, how can you have an electric current kind of go through? And this is a question that has kind of interesting kind of connections related to like electronics and kind of materials and stuff like that. But kind of step one in exploring this in the lab was getting these nanocrystals to form like a nice ordered arrangement, like a honeycomb or something like that. And you might think that what we did is, you know, kind of precisely place each one. And there are people who did things like that. But what we did, especially myself and, uh, and another person I worked closely with, we took the, uh, the lazy route of trying to get these nanocrystals coated by something such that they would be in a liquid, you put the liquid on like a surface, you go get some coffee, come back 10 minutes later, and it's arranged itself into like a nice honeycomb lattice. Beautiful. So we were able to do that. And I just became more and more fascinated by that than by the electronic properties of this thing. The idea that uh, material can like self-assemble itself. And this isn't a purely um, biophysical Right. or bio, a biological trait, like in this example, is, it's not biological at all. Um, but biology is the master of this thing of right. self-assembly. Biology has made use of it, right? Exactly. Biology has really made use of it. And in fact, um, you know, this, uh, just coming back to the book just for a second, this notion of self-assembly is what I kind of write as one of the four kind of grand unifying themes of biological physics. Right. And what I mean by this is the idea idea that the instructions for um, building a structure or even a function are encoded in the components of the thing themselves. So the little particles in that sense, their instructions were encoded into their surface properties and stuff to form themselves into a nice lattice. Here I'm showing a protein. This is myoglobin, which carries uh, oxygen in the muscle. 
And it's like all proteins, it's this long chain-like thing. And how does it adopt this really exquisite shape? There's no outside thing that you know, does origami on it, and folds it into place. Rather, mm -hmm. it encodes its own instructions. It has parts that are, uh, for example, positively charged. Things moving here. There we go. Parts that are negatively charged, those come together. It has parts that like water and parts that don't like water, those come together. So there's this, this theme of self-assembly that this shows up in lots and lots of living things. Um, soap bubbles, cells in a fly's eye, um, all of these have beautiful structures that are encoded by the material itself. So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, the self-assembly stuff is really, really neat. If I want to study self-assembly and these kinds of things, bio biophysical, like living systems are like the, the paragon of this. So let me move towards that direction. So I took a bit of a leap and after getting my PhD, um, I joined a lab in the chemistry department actually at UC Berkeley, looking at like so, essentially cell membranes or materials that were kind of simplified cell membranes, looking at how things like proteins organize themselves here. And it was definitely a steep learning curve. Um, but it was a fascinating one. And I, I uh, my lunchtime reading for about the first nine months was the thousand page molecular biology of the cell, like undergraduate textbook, just to give myself the kind of background that, that I would want that I would need. And I kind of moved from there to, to other topics like, like these guys, but I can come back to that later if you want. Well, I think I should stop asking you questions and let you keep telling some more story. Oh, sure. Um, cool. So, this actually worked out really nicely because I show I, what I was going to do next is, is point out, you know, in, in thinking about how to write this book and really how to, you know, take all these really wonderful phenomena and tie them together. You know, I was asking myself a lot, what are the unifying themes of biophysics? And there isn't, I should point out, especially for, um, you know, everybody out there, th this isn't, um, you know, biophysics is this, this very vibrant, uh, very contemporary kind of field. And perhaps because of that, there isn't a canonical answer to this question. Like, what are the unifying themes of biophysics? You might get a bunch of different answers if you ask a bunch of different biophysicists. And probably the most common answers you would get would have to do with things like thermodynamics and information and energy and so on, which are very uh, deep and very powerful. But I wanted something that's really more kind of intuitive and gives us a sense, um, you know, especially for a very you know, broad ranging and, and general book, what are kind of intuitive concepts that, that pull all this together. So um, I came up with a few, which especially bouncing off of lots of people like Phil, for example, um, I think do a good job of, of uh, spanning the things that a lot of us care about. So one, as I mentioned, is this idea of self-assembly, that instructions are encoded in, in life's materials themselves. And this takes place across, across scales from like molecules, to like cells as illustrated here with these fly cells that adopt you know, the same shapes as soap bubbles, in fact, for, for similar reasons. Um, yeah, so throughout scales. The next one, there we go, is the notion that life can assemble into what I call regulatory circuits. So what I mean by that is things that can take in inputs and do kind of calculations on them and, and um, adjust their behavior accordingly. Now, in a sense, we um, the fact that this must be going on is, if you stop to think about it, obvious both because you know we learn from experience and things like that, but also at even a more deep kind of molecular scale, um, you know, we all have uh, a genome of, of our human DNA. And every single one of our cells, with the exception of some immune cells, have exactly the same set of DNA as every other cell. But your different cells are doing very different things. So there, there must be things that kind of take in stimuli or past experiences and so on and say, okay, I'm going to read out the genes in this part of the DNA and not in another part. Um, and those things can interact with each other and form this whole network of kind of decisions and interactions that make very complex behavior possible out of pretty simple components. So this notion of regulatory circuits, um, here we have a little protein binding to DNA, and then something triggers that to change shape and not bind to DNA, making certain parts of DNA you know, functional or not functional, um, is illustrated by that cartoon. So regulatory circuits are another kind of cross-cutting theme that comes about. The third, and um, 
it's hard to pick favorites and perhaps I shouldn't, but I, I have to say I really like this one, <laughs> is um, this notion that there's a randomness inherent in pretty much every biological phenomenon. Some of this comes about because um, of a very deep physical law, if you want to call it that, that everything actually at very, very small scales is moving. If you look at a microscope, there's little specks of dust and things like that aren't standing still. You have a bunch of, you know, specks of dust in a dish of water. They're all actually jiggling about. They're doing this random motion that has been observed since uh, Robert Brown, a botanist, um, discovered it in the 19th century. So we have this randomness, but superimposed on that or, or coexisting with that is predictability. I can't tell you exactly where the dust speck is going, but I can tell you very accurately the average position of the dust speck. And what that means for biology is that there are a lot of phenomena that are in a sense very random, like the diffusion, or sorry, the, the motion of molecules that set where like limbs and things end up being in like an, an, an embryo, like you when you were an embryo that um, involve these random motions, but that are nonetheless predictable enough that the limbs that result from the, the positions of these molecules end up being very robustly patterned and positioned and so on. So there's a predictable ran randomness to stuff. This comes up not just with motion, but with things like um, genetic interactions. So there are traits um, like height that are influenced by hundreds and hundreds of different genes. Um, so little segments of DNA, the specific nature of which uh, alters, you know, what the height of a human, for example, is going to be. Now, there are so many of these, it's almost like our little random motions of, of objects. You, it's, you can't really say what one gene is contributing to height or another, but you can look at the ensemble. And these days with modern techniques for reading DNA and things like that, predict just from like the, the ensemble of these um, hundreds and hundreds of genes, how tall someone is going to be just based on their genome with an accuracy of a couple of centimeters. So there's randomness or kind of unpredictability in a way superimposed with predictability in an average sense. Um, and as I, as I commented in the book, that's important not only for kind of microscopic things or things like limb patterning, but also how we think about a lot of the genetic information that we're getting these days from things like DNA sequencing and disease risks and um, embryo selection and all of this stuff. So finally, the last one, this one of course is not a drawing, but instead a, a photo I took um, from uh, a class I taught, the big thing in the front is an elephant femur. <laughs> so theme number four is this notion of scaling that different physical laws depend on things like size in different ways. And that it turns out places very strong uh, kind of constraints or guides on how um, living creatures um, are structured. So things like why bigger animals need disproportionately thick bones compared to smaller ones. So this elephant here, its bones may be like you know, twice as long as a, as a dog bones, but four times as wide. That follows from the way things like the force of gravity uh, versus the strength of a beam, um, how those things scale, so to speak, or depend on size. So if you can if you can uncover these scaling relationships, like how different physical forces depend on size, it makes a lot of things, especially having to do with like the form of animals and plants and so on, make a lot of sense. So those are the themes there. Um, yeah, those are the themes that, that came together. So that's making me think, you know, a lot of us are alive today because of a vaccine that belongs to a category that didn't even exist five years ago and was not just purely imitating nature but was taking lessons from nature to learn how to package rna and one thing i love about your book is that there are these sidelights not only into strictly how does nature do things but what did we learn technologically and what can we do having picked up a lesson from nature and thought about it in a physical way wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, that theme, because that seems like a big theme. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, yeah, it's a great, uh, great point. So, um, yeah, one of the things, especially in the last third of the book that I, I try to focus on are like the really quite amazing biotechnologies that exist and how their existence actually owes a lot to a biophysical perspective, even if they're not always kind of categorized as biophysics. 
So in a sense, it's really taking seriously this idea that things like DNA and proteins and so on are actual physical objects with uh, physical properties. And understanding those properties lets us do things with them. So to give you an example, um, you know, DNA is, well, uh, DNA is negatively charged. So it has a negative electrical charge. And that, it turns out, is hugely important to all kinds of things, both in its natural uses, so the fact that it's negatively charged affects how it's like packaged in cells and things like that, but also things like um, how it's used biotechnologically. Like you can take snippets of DNA and separate them based on size compared to other pieces of DNA by doing things like applying electric field. And that's a very kind of fundamental step to like so many biotechnologies. Um, and it's really just making use of this, this, um, this fact that things are charged. And there's other you know, tasks that make use of things like the fact that it's a long molecule and you know, Wrigley and, and stuff like that. So we can do things like move around DNA, encapsulate it in things, duplicate it, and make just from you know, one piece of DNA, two, four, eight, 16 millions that you need to do these modern things of gene sequencing and so on by really taking seriously uh, the physical properties of DNA. I'll point out two kind of examples, uh, one in the book and one not. One that um, is, is that one of the kind of contemporary ways of sequencing DNA, in other words, finding out the sequence of A's, C's, T's, and G's that uh, make up that, that strand, is to actually have, I didn't bring a, anything squiggly, but here's my DNA, to have that DNA going through just a little pore that you've made in some, uh, some kind of surface and measure actually the electrical current going through this pore that's different depending on what exactly the little DNA letter that happens to be in the pore at that time is. So I'm threading this through and reading, okay, here's how much current I get, that must be an A. Here's how much current, that's a G. Here's current, how much current, that's an A again. So again, really kind of taking seriously the physicality of this stuff. Uh, one of the, my favorite things to write in the book was just going through how, how some of these gene sequence and things actually work because they're they're just they're they're quite stunning the thing you described <laughs> sounds like total science fiction but now you can buy it it's a exactly it's a... you can buy it and not only that you can buy the, the whole machine that does yeah. this is like literally the size of a usb thumb drive and actually has a usb extension on it you can plug that into your computer and that's doing the the gene sequencing for you um you can buy this it's it's really just mind-boggling to quickly comment on, because you mentioned the vaccines, this isn't in the book because it, it was too late, but uh, um, as you may know, like the Moderna and uh, Pfizer vaccines, or um, yeah, make use of uh, um, RNA. That's this molecule that's like DNA, that DNA kind of uh, encodes for. And there's a lot one could talk about with the beauty of how these vaccines work. But one thing I'll just briefly point out, these RNA vaccines, have this um, viral RNA encapsulated actually in more or less a shell of lipids, which are basically, I don't know where I put my drawing, but these, these guys. And we have this encapsulation of RNA by these. And getting that to work actually took decades of work. And one of the things that made it possible is again, making use of the fact that, hey, this RNA, it has a strong negative, negative charge let's make some positively charged lipids to kind of stabilize that and make a structure that holds all this together. Then to be extra clever, let's make lipids where their charge depends on like how acidic the environment around them is. So that when they're taken up by cells, that charge changes and RNA can more easily escape, allowing your cells to read this RNA and make something that your body will target. So and in all of these, amazing. like these physical properties just do keep coming up again and again. It's amazing people were not pursuing the cure to this particular illness at that time. For those decades of work, they were pursuing curiosity. They wanted to know how things work. And um, then millions and millions of lives got saved. So uh, that's... Yeah, that's one, yeah, exactly. An amazing exactly. story. And even though it's not explicitly in your book, you know, all the background is in there, which I think a lot of people will be happy to, to read about. Hey, before we move into the q and I just wanted to ask you, Raghu, you know, I think a lot of our listeners may not realize the enormous effort 
that goes into the craft of writing something that seems to be effortless. And I just kind of wondered, without going into a lot of your process, uh, what do you do to uh, to help yourself to get that clarity and flow that uh, characterize some books and not others? So can you say a little bit about how you... Yeah, thank you. you. Um, yeah, so yeah, first of all, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm glad it, it seems to have turned out well. Um, it's a great question. And in a sense, it, it took me a long time to write this book. And um, it's sort of earliest forms, not really as a book, but it's, it's earliest manifestations in any form were around kind of 2010 or so. And I think there were like really two key things. One is that I actually um, created and taught a uh, biophysics for non-science majors course. And yeah. that helped me flesh out, especially things that ended up being kind of the first third of the book. Um, not just not just in terms of like what how to explain things, but you know, especially doing a, a, a new kind of course, especially for people who don't have like a burning passion for science, but you know, are kind of interested in it and need some uh, need to satisfy some science requirements at the university. It's a very good crowd <laughs> because you start to see which things capture people's attention and which are kind of flops. And there definitely were some flops, which you know did not make it into the book. Um, so that kind of was phase one. And then I started to really think seriously, okay, would this work as a book? What are all the things that, you know, if I really want to be like harsh with myself that, you know, people might not find exciting and let me scrap those. Um, and then I sort of proposed this. I spent a lot of time writing a book proposal and proposed this and uh, Princeton University Press um, uh, bit. And I had just really nice interactions with them. And especially my editor there, Jessica Yao, really pushed me on the thing of, okay, how does chapter 10 tie back to things in chapter two? Like really getting at, okay, what are themes that permeate things and getting me to focus kind of really more on not just a collection of chapters, but things that really do hearken across them. And that was really plot. difficult. Yeah, plot, plot in a way, yes. That's a good way to yeah. put it, yeah. Um, yeah. And I have to say that was very difficult. It took me a lot of just staring, at, you know, sitting in the cafe, just trying to, think drawing little kind of diagrams of what's in one chapter and what ties things together with others yeah yeah but then making that visible to the reader without those diagrams is another art <laughs> yeah well uh, i think you were very successful hey thank you i think it's time for our question and answer session and uh one of our attendees greets you and says, could you tell us a bit more about the illustrations in the book? Were you oh, yes. interested in art? Were you always planning on having your illustrations in the final book? Uh, how did that come about? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, that's a, that, yeah, thanks, that's a wonderful question. Um, I have actually always been interested in art. I, I don't think, I, I like how the illustrations turned out. I actually don't think I'm a terribly good watercolorist, but at, at least I don't think I embarrass myself too much. And I've been you know, doing this as a hobby for, for many years. And I would write also just or draw or paint illustrations for things in class and actually sometimes for um, actual scientific articles too. And I have a couple of like journal covers and, and stuff like that. So I enjoy doing that. And, and I, also, I also feel a little bit like when I'm, when I'm painting scientific things, it also counts a little bit as work. So it's a bit combining fun and, and productivity. Um, so even from the beginning, I did want to have illustrations be part of the book. And that was part of my conversations with the publisher, even from the beginning. And they were very supportive. And in fact, interestingly, in the early stages, the thought was that I would only be allowed to have like 10 color illustrations. So I actually spent a lot of time thinking, okay, what, what makes the cut or not? Um, and then actually, you know, many months into it, or maybe even at least a year into it, uh, they said, okay, go for it. <laughs> you can make, you know, enough, you know, I forget how many we have at the moment, but something like 25 or something like that, and, and that, that would be okay. So I, I was very happy about that. Um, cool. I forget, was there something else in the question? Well, um, no, you answered it. Okay. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you'd want to say something to another listener who says, I, I loved hearing you talk about making biophysics widely known to students. Was there a specific topic that was especially hard to explain in an approachable, accessible way in your book? That's a great question. Um, I guess it depends if you mean things that made it into the book or things that didn't make it into the book. 
Um, some of each, yeah. What What are some that you couldn't? So you know, one that I could I, not. I always say, I always say, you're only as good as the best thing that you cut because it wasn't as good as the other things. <laughs> so Interesting. What could you just not do. So one thing, so I wanted, or I in, originally intended to have a chapter on uh, microscopy. So especially because yeah. so much of what we know, especially about things like cells and proteins and stuff, um, comes from no, sorry, microscopy and other ways of figuring out like structure. So I included like x-ray, uh, crystallography and, and things like that. So more technique based. And I even wrote kind of a draft of that and I bounced off of people, but both from class and from bouncing off of people, it became clear that that's the sort of thing where, I don't know how to put this, but uh, I find it much more interesting than most people do, or it's a tougher sell, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that did not make the cut. I still sometimes daydream. Is there a way to make a book about kind of technique or special or imaging or those sorts of things that's really kind of absorbing? And I don't know what the answer to that is. Well, um, sw switching to yeah. things you did do, you know, I was just really impressed at uh, your discussion of cells that sense forces and create forces oh, in this yeah. mm -hmm. burgeoning field of mechanobiology that we never heard about, and now it's exploding. Uh, right. This is a great place to to pick up some of that. And then oh. it was difficult for you because there weren't a million popular books already uh, trying to do it. Yeah, there were, there were a handful of things like that where I really did have to spend a lot of time just reading papers just to feel comfortable with saying and kind of distilling aspects. So the mechanobiology, how even individual cells sense like material and mechanical properties. Yeah, as Phil is pointing out, that, that was definitely one of those where I had to do quite a bit of homework. Um, some of the uh, things about kind of very cutting edge, like genomic prediction kinds of things, like uh, determining from genome sequences what we can and can't know, um, that took a lot of reading, but was super fascinating. Um, and it's a very, very timely topic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah moving to a much bigger scale, uh, Ava here is asking you if you had any uh, words to say on the subject of free will. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. That is a great, so I, I actually really like that question. Um, yeah. So I, I'll point out at the very beginning, I don't think I have anything terribly profound to say about free will. Um, and there's m like many, many people who think a lot about this and who've written great stuff. Um, I have to say my favorite book that I've read on the subject uh, is, I have a terrible memory. It's it's the subtitle is the variety of free will worth having. Do you know this one, Phil? Elbow room, yes. Um, it is by Daniel Dennett, D E N N E T T. Yes. Uh, called Elbow room: the varieties of free will free will worth having. I highly recommend that one. You know, okay. So where where I come, I have to kind of admit there have been especially a few years ago, I kind of went through this phase where I was really kind of wondering a lot about this whole question of free will and what people have thought about it. And I would actually kind of stay up at nights thinking about this question, do we have free will? And I eventually kind of settled on kind of the same view that's, that's put forth in the book I just mentioned, the Daniel Dennett one, that, you know, we, um, okay, summarizing this in two sentences is going to be kind of hard, but I'm kind of okay with everything having to do with our consciousness being a property of physical law. So in that sense, not having free will. But nonetheless, we are creatures that turn all these things into decision-making regulatory circuitry. And if you ask yourself, what would it look like to be a thing that's kind of programmed by its own components and that can then observe those things, it would look a lot like free will. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> So this is what Daniel Dennett kind of calls the free will worth having, the sort of, um, you have an identity and you have the sort of observation of the things that you're doing. And really, if you think about it a lot, what else would you want? Because if you're saying that there's something that exists outside of kind of physical law, that's a really tough thing to ask for. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay. The philosophers out there are going to, are going to send me angry emails, but uh, well, I like it. I don't know about that, but we have a lot more questions. People oh, are uh, really excited by your talk. Um, so here's one that's much more microscopic. Uh, 
one of your attendees is asking, what do you mean when you say DNA is negatively charged? Does it literally have extra electrons? Yeah, so what I mean is like negatively charged just in the same sense that, um, you know, anything that you learn about in a physics class or something has extra or has charge or, or chemistry class. So a negative charge could be extra electrons or um, like uh, uh, losing a uh, proton, like losing a hydrogen ion. And so therefore like losing a positive charge. So you have a net negative charge uh, or gaining some, uh, you know, uh, proton or some other piece that has a positive charge. So yes, just having more or fewer electrons and protons, um, however that's that's accomplished. But exactly the same things that describe charge as describe charge in a semiconductor or a, a transistor. You should emphasize that there are some matching positive charges, but they float away. Oh, yes, good. Yeah, thank you. In the neighborhood, Excellent. but they're not right on it. Anyway. Right, right. Yeah, so I guess it's important to keep in mind, like if, if I have... Um, you know, a protein that like loses a positive charge, it doesn't kind of disappear. It's out there floating around in the water. Uh, right. But the kind of protein molecule then has a negative charge. The environment in, near it maybe has a net positive charge. Uh, so there isn't a, a, overall everything ends up being neutral, but the particular components can have charges. Thank you, Phil. But already there's many fascinating aspects of how that oh, definitely. works. So uh, now moving to the even even bigger scale, the biggest scale of all, uh, Mike is asking, in 10 years, will life still have any mystery? You know, that's a wonderful question. Um, yes. <laughs> um, short answer is yes. And 10 years, like there's a lot of areas, in fact, like uh, what Phil was mentioning about how even individual cells sense mechanical forces how like organs grow to particular shapes and sizes. There's a lot of things we don't understand. Um, and yes. it's far more than enough to keep us busy for 10 years. I, I think um, it's a tougher question if you want to ask 100. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, Self-assembly is maybe a metaphor for embryogenesis, but it's not the answer to, meta to embryogenesis. Exactly, exactly. And we don't have a great answer to even very kind of tangible question. You know, how do you both your arms end up the same length? Um, there's a lot of things like that that we don't understand. So, I mean, we have more than enough to do for 10 years. It's an, yeah. it's a tougher question. What will things look like in, you know, hundred years or a thousand years, but I'm, I'm, there's all kinds of things we don't know about that time scale. Yeah. An another listener says that, you know, reminds us that the RNA vaccine story, uh, had a lot of implications about, you know, unpredictable careers of scientists and ask, you know, how can we foster the careers of people who are, are fitting into the interstices and uh, may not get normal kinds of funding and so on, but may have important discoveries that need to be made? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And, um, you know, I don't have a fantastic answer to that. I think intellectually there, there's, you know, a lot of excitement, a lot of these kind of boundary areas. And there is, you know, um, kind of dedicated funding and things for um, a lot of these things. There's a NSF, National Science Foundation program for the physics of living systems, for example. Um, it is true though, that it can often be difficult to do things like get funding from, especially the, the kind of large traditional pots of money like the National Institutes of Health and so on. This is actually, so uh, Phil mentioned this, new report from the National Academy of Sciences on biological physics, one of the things that actually kind of calls for working on more is making it clearer to things like funding agencies, the value of these interstitial fields. Um, so how to do that is actually, I think, one of our challenges. Um, so it's a great question. Um, but I think question. there's quite a lot of attention given to that question in the funding agencies. I don't think they're unaware of the implications of this big story. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know uh, if you want to comment yourself on what your thoughts are on that question, Phil. Pardon me? I don't know if you want to comment specifically on things like funding. Well, I, I think I'd rather hit more of these questions from our really astute audience. Uh, mm -hmm. What type of job could someone get with an undergraduate degree in biophysics? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Or can you just or do you simply have to get a higher de degree? No, than no, that? no. So actually, that's a great, great question. 
you know, it, it also occurred to me while I'm answering that question, I'm going to put up the last slide I had, which has like my blog site and my email address, because I'm I'll try my best to answer questions by email as well. Um, so undergraduates in like I've had many undergraduate researchers like in my group, and some of them have been like physics majors, some biology majors, some other things like chemistry, um, but they all kind of end up being biophysicists. And some of them have gone on to just higher studies, like graduate school in physics, but also in things like bioengineering. But several of them have gone into like biotech of various various sorts. Um, so there's actually quite a, a, a good demand for people who know things about biology, but are also kind of quantitative or physical in the way they think. Um, one of my former undergrads now works for um, Genentech, which is one of the very large kind of biotechnology companies. Um, another one works for Calico, which is Google's life sciences wing. Um, so there's, especially I would say actually in the last five or 10 years, um, a pretty strong uh, kind of path from like biophysics to biotech. Okay, I'm gonna stop that one, see. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, I think it's clear that we could spend the entire next four or five hours <laughs> answering questions from this excited audience. Uh, I think we're gonna have to cut it off after just one more though, because of the time limit we were given. Um, let me just uh, ask, I'm just going to ask the next question. Um, four principles. Why four principles? Why not <laughs> five or six? Or how did you how did you decide that there were four? And uh, are there others? Oh, that's yeah. a that's a great one. That okay. alone will take five or six hours. I know. I'm not sure I can answer that that quickly. So I felt four was my upper bound because after that, you know, it just again it seems to just seem like too much of a hodgepodge. Even though you know there's. 10 habits of highly successful people and all this and stuff like that. So I figured out, you know, four, I just, you know, for no great reason, I said it for myself as kind of an upper bound. And why not three? Well, because in my list, I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to take out any of those four. I felt like take, getting rid of any of those would, would, uh, yeah. would, would leave phenomena that I wanted to talk about without a theme that, that intersected them. So I felt like this four spans all the things I want to talk about. I, I so think a listener who wants the next two or three after that might very much enjoy a book called The Way Life Works by Malon Hoagland. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think you've mentioned, yeah. I don't know if there's a way to put book suggestions into the chat, but. Uh, I think I'm going to put it in an answer in the Q&A to uh, okay, wonderful. Richard Halper. And uh, then I think we're going to have to run, run out. But uh, while I'm typing that in, um, now, Pepper says it seems to a layperson that the notion of structural rules of life used to fall more into discussions of evolution and natural selection. When did biology start addressing these structural commonalities with physics rather than pinning it all on evolution? So that's a great question. A question like, I'd say. What? A trick question. <laughs> so it's interesting because evolution is another kind of unifying principle of a lot of, of biological phenomena. And I do feel like these go together kind of very well because you know evolution is kind of the pathway by which you can kind of navigate the space of, of organisms and stuff. But physics really sets what that landscape is. Like, you know, the, the idea that the bigger animals need disproportionately thick bones, that's set by you know, these principles of, of forces of gravity and mechanical strength and stuff like that. And evolution has to act within these constraints. Now, evolution can then say, okay, well, the animal, the offspring that are, are developing disproportionately thick bones, they're going to be the most likely to survive and pass those traits on. And that's how you end up kind of following this path. But the constraints are set by kind of the, the physical uh, the physical rules. That's a very short answer, but that, that might be a way to kind of think about how these things fit together. Um, and there have been people, especially in the kind of more biomechanics -y realm, who have thought this way for actually many decades. What's been more uh, new is applying that thinking to even smaller scales, like you know DNA or cells or organs, and realizing that you know that kind of 
biomechanical in a way or biophysical perspective really applies all the way down. And evolution has to, evolution can't do just whatever it wants. It has to operate within this landscape. Well, thank you, Raghu. I mean, this has been a really wonderful evening and- uh... Well, th thanks, thanks a lot. This has been a lot of fun, and, and your questions are wonderful, and uh, and the audience questions are really fantastic, and I'm sorry we could, could go through all of them. Uh, but yeah, this I has think, been a lot of fun. I think there's much to learn from uh, everything that came up tonight, so thanks very much. And thank you so much to both of you for being here. This was such um, a fun and insightful conversation, and uh, Roger V, your demonstration was so fun <laughs> as well. Um, and thanks to all of you out there as well for spending your evening with us. Uh, please check out So Simple a Beginning on harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Mass. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Keep reading and be well. Good night. Thanks a lot. <laughs>